It's uh, been a great pleasure so far. I've had great conversations with people, uh, many of them about things I know nothing about, which is the point, I think. Um, but let me start off with a question. How many of us are running on coffee? Starting the day with coffee? Yes? Come on, I see a lot of coffee cups and hands out there. I mean, come on, yeah, okay. Why is that? Why do people start the day with coffee? Caffeine is one answer, it's to wake you up, right? All right, so... Caffeine wakes you up, and, and there it is. I think, yeah, we've got, a, got the structure on the screen there. Why would, why would a coffee plant make something that wakes you up? What sense does that make? It doesn't, it doesn't do anything for photosynthesis. It's not a growth regulator. In fact, it doesn't do anything specific in the daily life of the plant. So why is coffee making this stuff? And it's not to help you out. It's an insecticide. Caffeine, like nicotine, and many other molecules of the same type, made by plants, are insecticides, and they work by uh, interacting with the nervous system, which is composed you know, of nerves that come to ends, and there's a synapse, a space between them, where messages go back and forth, and you see a picture of one on the screen there. And there are many specific molecules, natural in our bodies. Uh, cannabinoids is one of them. Uh, a favorite of many people in California. Um, and these signals tell us what we're doing, how we feel, and whether or not we're awake. And it so happens that caffeine looks just like the signal that your nervous system uses to keep you awake. Uh, and so when it winds up in your synapses between your nerves and your brain, it's doing what your brain would ordinarily like to be doing, and that is waking up. But you do have to ans answer the question, why would coffee make that? And the answer is, caffeine, like its relatives, is the fungicide, uh, the microbial side, and an insecticide. And it protects plants against things. Plants play these kinds of tricks on us all the time. Here's another example. Uh, many of us, particularly those of us who are not crazy, uh, think that hot pepper is painful to consume. Uh, and you know, you think, well, is pain the right word? I mean, is even heat the right word? Because after all, the pepper is cold. I mean, it's not actually hot. But every cell in your body has receptors on them to sample the environment and determine whether it's in danger of being burned. These are high heat receptors. They open and close and tell a cell what to do if there's a threat of being burned by something. Well, pepper plants make a molecule, and you can see the picture of it there, that that activates the painful burn receptor in animal cells. So the game that peppers are playing is to get you to stop eating them because you think, you literally think, and your body literally thinks you're going to be burned. I mean, it's just an amazing trick. Plants do the same thing with cold receptors. Can you think of what kinds of chemistry you're familiar with that would turn on your cold receptors? Mint, that's right. The active ingredients in mints, particularly menthol, activate the cold receptors in your cells, and your body literally thinks it's cold. Plants are doing these things not because it's entertaining, they're doing them to protect themselves mostly. In fact, many of the things that you and I uh, use and enjoy every day, uh, we use and enjoy for this reason, because the plants are loaded with things we, we want to exploit. So, Aspirin started off as a chemical defense in, uh, in willow trees. Uh, the first people used willow trees that chewed the bark to relieve pain. Uh, we talked about caffeine. The, the red color and the, uh, the tannins in a red wine uh, are defensive chemicals in grapes. Uh, nicotine, we already mentioned, that, and that was, by the way, a really good cigar. Um, and almost all of our spices look, taste, and smell the way they do because the plant behind them has evolved these tricks for protecting itself against one another enemies. Uh, in fact, you're probably familiar with lots of plant products that are used as insecticides and other kinds of pesticides. Uh, the oldest, or one of the oldest insecticides that humans ever used was ground up tobacco. Uh, nicotine is one of our oldest successful insecticides. Uh, rotenone is used by uh, people in the tropics to paralyze fish. Uh, and 
again, the bottom line here is that plants are making these things to protect themselves, and we've exploited them. <coughs> and they can be exploited in agriculture as well. <coughs> some of you are probably familiar with this, but uh, some people are using uh, brassicas to, uh, as fumigants. In fact, they outperform methyl bromide in many situations. Uh, because the glucosinolates, the chemicals that protect the brassicas from, from their enemies, uh, are excellent fumigants and excellent antifungal agents. These kinds of things have an impact throughout the natural and managed ecosystem. If the leaves of a brassica plant falling to the ground and decomposing uh, can release chemicals that have antifungal activity, for example, that means that in general, plant litter, when it enters the soil, is carrying with it a chemistry that can modulate the activities among all of the organisms there. Uh, I used to work a lot with uh, oak trees, which are very rich in tannins, which get the name because you use them to tan proteins. And tanning proteins means you make them indigestible. If you didn't make your, your my leather belt indigestible, it would have fallen off weeks ago uh, because it would rot. Uh, every plant species has a specific chemistry. <clears throat> Lots of legumes, particularly birds for trefoil, for example, are rich in tannins. Uh, and when those leaves enter the soil system, they inhibit digestion by fungi and bacteria, and they alter nitrogen cycle and nutrient cycling in those soils. So the mix of plants growing on a site turns into a mix of litters, which represents a mix of chemistry that then influences everything else that's going on in the soil. So uh, a healthy soil is theoretically rich in chemistry. In fact, the relationship between productivity on a site and the number of species of plants growing on the site is not as significant as the relationship between productivity on the site and the diversity of the chemistry coming out of those plants on the site. Something we discovered a number of years ago when my lab was in, important in doing this is that every time you wound a plant or infect it with something, it increases the production of these chemicals, which makes perfect sense. Plants like you and me respond against enemies with defenses. So if you damage an uh, a uh, tobacco plant like this one, it greatly increases the production of nicotine. In fact, that makes a, a tobacco crop more valuable because it, the pricing can be based on nicotine content. So people figured this out a long time ago. <clears throat> in order to show that kind of thing, that a plant is changing its chemistry in response to attack, you, the experiment it should be obvious to anybody. You want to attack some plants, and you want to compare what they do with plants that are not attacked. Uh, and I've been doing experiments like that for many, many years. And uh, here's a th theoretical setup. We've got a plant on the left that uh, is being chewed by some insect, and we've got plants nearby that are not. Uh, an interesting fact happens here, and that is that when you wound any plant, it emits odors that are active in other plants. So when we, wo whoops, when we wound that plant on the left, it turns on defenses in the plant near it, uh, but doesn't do that if we insert a uh, barrier between the two plants. The, the experiment that happened here was we wounded the plant on the left. We looked for changes in the plants near it. The plant next to it changed its defenses, turned on its defenses, even though they were not in the same pot. They were just in the same airspace. And the plant that was farther away never changed. Uh, so we thought, well, there must be some connection between those first two plants. Uh, blocking the airspace, shut off that response by plant number two, and we concluded that these plants were in a way sort of communicating with each other through the air. Uh, I was a youngster at the time, that's me with more hair and less gut uh, on the left, and an undergraduate student who was working with me at the time. Uh, we published a paper on that result, and uh, we had the habit of referring to this as talking plants or talking trees. And, uh, news people got a hold of this, and I was very quickly uh, on the phone with a reporter who uh, didn't identify himself or who he was writing for. And I have to tell you, this was the last time that happened. Uh, so I didn't know who this was, and I was all excited, and we were talking about it. And as a result of that interview, the first uh, non-science publication of our work occurred in this publication. <laughs> this is why I, I always ask the reporter who you are and who you're writing for now. You know, it's, 
uh, it's pretty important. Uh, but they did a really nice job of the story. And once the story got really big and it did, it went all around the world, uh, they took credit. Uh, you heard it here first, or you read it here first, the National Choir. So. And it was a lot of fun. We, had, we found ourselves in People magazine um, in all sorts of odd places. I made lots of science enemies because scientists at the time didn't think that communicating with regular folks was important. But we all know that's not true. Um, so this was kind of a big deal at the time. Uh, and it's a big deal uh, going forward because that story has now been repeated over and over again and we know much more now about, about this kind of communication between plants. In fact, uh, a field like any of your fields is emitting molecules like the ones on the screen here, many of which the, you know, have odors that you would recognize right away. Some of them are like cinnamon and some of them are like flowers and, and other things. That's going on all the time, but it changes when something happens to the plant. And so far, everything that anybody has ever done to a plant, any plant, has been shown to cause that plant to produce a unique set of smells, like a fingerprint. If you can assess the smells, you can tell what happened to the plant. In fact, in, in tobacco plants, if caterpillar species A attacks the plant, it emits one set of odors. If a different species of caterpillar B attacks the same set of plants, they emit different odors. So you can actually identify the insect species that way. So this is going on all the time, and the fingerprints are getting to be really well developed. Uh, this is one for corn. Uh, the molecules you see here are the ones that are typically produced by corn plants when they're being attacked by insects. This happens both above and below ground in response to uh, corn rootworm. Corn roots produce uh, volatile odors that travel up to two meters through the soil and attract beneficial nematodes that, that then attack the beetles. So both above and below ground, you've got this kind of conversation going on uh, with plants influencing each other. Are they really trying to do that? I mean, uh, one thing you have to ask right away is, uh, if I'm being attacked, why would I help my neighbor you know, avoid attack? I mean, they're just going to outcompete me. Uh, as an individual plant, that doesn't necessarily make sense. So in more recent work uh, in my lab, we've, we've actually been able to show that um, whether or not nearby plants are, are figuring out what's going on, uh, plants are mainly using, or one of the things they're doing with these signals is talking to themselves. If one of these plants is uh, attacked on one of the young leaves at the top, uh, typically what we see is that the entire plant changes its chemistry and becomes resistant. So there has to be communication inside the plant, moving things around to tell it to turn things on in all different places. The problem with doing that inside the plant through phloem and xylem is that that's really slow. But some of these plants can change their chemistry in a matter of minutes. So how could they possibly communicate, say, from the bottom at the top of the plant in a matter of minutes when it takes phloem and xylem, you know, a couple of hours to do that? Uh, well, the answer apparently is the use of these volatile odors. Um, if you damage one leaf on a small tree, for example, pretty soon all the leaves within uh, a certain distance from that leaf will start changing the chemistry and become better defended. And wh what you can do is you can, you can uh, shuttle the airflow around the plant and determine which leaves you will turn on and which leaves you will turn off by focusing the odors in different places. So one of the main functions of this kind of plant communication may be self-communication, essentially telling all the parts of the plant it's time to get defended. But if you're going to do that, then eavesdropping is possible. Uh, and it's more likely that what we originally discovered, which was this communication between plants, is actually a consequence of one plant eavesdropping on another plant's signaling to itself, which actually makes more evolutionary sense. Uh, <clears throat> that can have negative consequences for plants. Anybody recognize this evil plant? Hmm? No, yeah, everybody always says kudzu. No, it's not. Dotter, it's called dotter, yeah. And it's a parasitic plant. Uh, it's a seed plant, so it grows from seeds, and when it finds a host, it wraps around the host, and it's, it's like a vampire. It literally sucks uh, the goodies out of, out of the host plant. And it's, generally speaking, lethal to the host plant. Well, think about this for a minute. This plant produces seeds, they fall on the ground over winter, Next spring, it's got to find a new host. Those seeds have to, have to uh, germinate, and the, the new plant has to go out and find a new host. How do they find a new host? <clears throat> well, 
here's how they do it. You see that's a seedling of a daughter plant on the right, and that's a tomato plant on the left. The daughter seed has just germinated, and the little stem is looking for, looking for, looking for a host plant. And it found it. If you put a glass jar over that tomato plant, the parasite will not find it. If you show the parasite a picture of a tomato plant, it won't find it. Okay. Uh, if you could get a tomato to talk, it wouldn't find it either, okay? Uh, but if you take the odor of a tomato plant and put it on a Q-tip, the parasite will go right to the Q-tip, right? So if you're going to make a signal that gets out into the air, you open yourself up to enemies that can exploit that by eavesdropping. But there's a much better, and for this group especially, more important uh, consequence of eavesdropping. This is a, a wheat midge, right? Uh, in all systems like this, agricultural and natural systems, the numbers of a pest like that are influenced significantly by parasitoid insects. And you see a little tiny wasp there on the right. That insect is a parasite of the wheat midge. It finds eggs and larvae, uh, injects its own eggs into them, and they consume the, the uh, pest. <clears throat> if you were to stop that, you would definitely see a change in the numbers of pests. It's been demonstrated over and over again in both natural and managed systems, unless you have eliminated these parasitoids, which pesticides often do, uh, they are important control agents. But here's the problem. Here's how big that, that wasp is. Okay? I mean, she's really tiny. And here's her problem. Somewhere out there, there is a midge. Okay, somewhere out there, it may, in fact, somewhere out there, there are midge eggs. Her job is to find them. So how does she do that? Well, as I said, plants, this is a tobacco example, plants are emitting odors all the time. You see the little green odors there. And when they are attacked by insects, like the wheat midge, the odor changes. Parasites, like the parasitic insects that help control uh, pests on crops and in nature, can tell what that odor is and identify where their prey is by following the odor trail. And in fact, the chances that any of those tiny little female wasps would ever find a midge in a wheat field without the wheat saying, here it is, are practically zero. So you've got cooperation essentially going on here between the plant calling in bodyguards, if you will, that help control the pest. <coughs> uh, if you eliminate that, and this is a tobacco plant that has been genetically modified so it cannot emit those odors, you see what's happened to it? Okay, in that case, tobacco hornworms will just completely defoliate the plant because none of the control agents are available to get to it. By the way, this is a really interesting use of a genetically modified organism. Uh, we've been saying for a long time that this is the way things work, but if you really wanted to demonstrate for sure that the plant's safety depended on this signaling system, you have to be able to shut off the signaling system. Uh, this has only been done once or twice, and in fact, this experiment was done by that teenager you saw in the picture of me early on, who was saying that trees talk. Uh, he's now a very famous scientist, and this is his specialty. Um, <clears throat> this kind of thing is exploitable. <clears throat> there are several businesses operating in California training dogs to identify infested plants, mainly grapevines, using dogs. Uh, as you know, dogs can diagnose disease and so forth. They have some several million times the number of uh, smell receptors that you and I have. Uh, so they're really good at this, and you can actually train them to find pest-infected plants. Um, that works pretty well in, in uh, vineyards in California, but for crop systems, we're developing our own dog nose, which you see a picture of in the lower left-hand corner there that we eventually hope to, to uh, let loose in fields uh, to tell us where there are pest infestations without actually having to go out and fill out a card or run a sweep net. Uh, it's still in test phases. We'll be testing that in uh, greenhouses this summer. Another application of this thing in agriculture is called push-pull agriculture, which is doing very well in Africa. Uh, if you know which plants are attractive to, to uh, beneficial insects, you know which plants repel uh, pest insects, uh, you can manipulate the mix of plants, primarily, of course, in small holding farms, 
to both attract good ones and repel bad ones. Uh, investigators from the United Kingdom are using this in uh, East Africa to great success now, and it seems to be working very well, but of course those are very, very small family farms. Okay, so let's take this below ground for a couple minutes. <clears throat> Everybody knows plants uh, take CO2, uh, and they use the carbon from that for a variety of things, for growth, reproduction, uh, and so some of that carbon goes up above ground, and as much as 40% or sometimes more winds up below ground. And of that, most of it, or much of it, whoops, winds up in the soil in various forms. That's, by the way, how plants have to feed mycorrhizae to get them to do their job. Uh, but bottom line here is that an enormous fraction of the carbon that plants gain winds up below ground. Uh, below ground, it's being picked up, moved around, and exchanged by mycorrhizae, which you're familiar with. All of the white in this picture is mycorrhizae. The only real roots are the yellow ones you see in this picture. So there's far more mycorrhizal uh, material there than there is roots. And what's turned out to be very interesting about this is that plants are connected to each other. Actually, you can see that in this picture. Plants connect to each other this way. <clears throat> and that has interesting pest consequences. Uh, here's an experimental setup with uh, two bean plants. And, uh, and no, I don't know if these are... are uh, what kind of beans they are? Well, anyway, uh, infested by aphids on the left. <clears throat> if you put a bean plant uninfested by aphids on the right next to it, it will develop resistance to those aphids because it's smelling the infestation next door. However, in a lot of cases, if you block the air between the two plants, the second plant remains resistant. But if you look below ground and you block the connections through mycorrhizae between the two plants, then the second plant uh, is uh, <clears throat> no longer repelling aphids. In other words, there's communication between these two plants, both through the air and below ground. And in this system, you've got to block both of them if you want to shut that off. All kinds of things are moving between plants this way. Nutrients. Uh, there are a lot of new studies using radioactive tracers to show that large trees feed small trees nearby. Uh, hormones are exchanged. The fences are exchanged. Uh, there's a real underground connection going on here. Uh, here's another example. This is an experiment done by some Israeli investigators. The, the plant in the pot in the center, colored red, uh, in these experiments is exposed to drought stress. All of the pots to the right uh, are connected, their soils are in contact with each other through pipes. All of the pots to the left are plants that are next to the stressed plant, but their soils are not connected to it. Now, a common and easily measured response to drought stress is stomates closing. Um, so you can look at these plants and ask whose stomates closed and whose didn't, and the answer is that as expected, uh, the plants that were in no way drought stressed themselves and were not connected to the drought stress plant, their stomates remained open, they were happy and not stressed. But not only did the stomates on the stressed target plant close in response to drought, so did the stomates of all the plants connected to them through the soil. So once again, evidently, there is an underground connection here, probably again mycorrhizae, but not necessarily, could also be volatiles, and that hasn't been worked out yet. Um, but an underground communication here that, that says that if one plant is drought stressed, the ones around it are likely to respond in the same way. Okay, there's connection between the above and the below ground. And that often happens when an insect is feeding above ground on the plant. Again, the plant's going to take up CO2, but uh, what we have shown is that much of that carbon instead of going into growth and below ground, goes into making defenses against the insect. In fact, uh, using radio labeled tracers and so forth, we can show what, how the carbon moves around in the plant in response to insect feeding, and a significant fraction is devoted to making chemical defenses. So what that means is that leaves less to go below ground and can reduce the amount of carbon that goes below ground to 10% or less. So all these other functions communication with other plants below ground, defending the roots against things below ground, um, supporting mycorrhizae and supporting rhizobium. Those are all carbon expensive things to do. Those are all uh, harder for the plant to do when it's being attacked above ground. <clears throat> 
So, think about this for a minute. We have plant above ground, attacked by insect, through the air or below ground, signals go to the plant next door, uh, which cause it to turn on its defenses. Turning on the defenses means that there's less material left over for growth and to run below ground. So there's the potential for the caterpillar in the upper left there to influence mycorrhizal infection and everything going on below ground for some distance around the one plant on which it's feeding. In fact, if you consider the below ground ecosystem, there's almost nothing that's happening below ground that isn't influenced, directed by, or managed by the chemistry of plants coming out of the roots. So if you monkey with any one of these things, you influence them all. There's just no way to change the behavior of a plant and not have widespread influence. And since plants are passing this on to each other, that widespread influence can go for some distance. So what this all amounts to is that you've got above ground conversations, you've got below ground conversations going on all the time. When you look at a field, uh, that's developed for any length of time, and certainly a, a natural setting, you can assume that most of the plants in that field are interacting with each other both above ground and through below ground connections. And that you cannot expect to influence one of those plants and not influence the plants around them. By the way, you can imagine how that has ruined experimental work for a lot of botanists. Because you can no longer have controls in the same airspace or anything, you know, it's really complicated. So there's a famous guy who said something about this, and probably a lot of you have heard this. Uh, uh, it, you know, I, I was a 1960s hippie, and we thought everything was connected. And here I spent 40 years only to find that, yep, everything's connected. It's really true. Uh, but that makes it, makes it interesting, and um, I think it's something that we all need to pay attention to, both above and below ground. So thanks very much for your attention. Thanks for the invitation. And come see us in Missouri at our Bond Life Sciences Center. Thank you. perceive smell is that there are proteins in your nasal passages, actually on your tongue and uh, some other places, uh, proteins that interact with the molecules that are flying around in the air. So that molecule finds its way to this protein, and that tells your nervous system you smell it, okay? That kind of, we have um, a couple of dozen different kinds of those molecules, and our, our brain can uh, take a couple of dozen different signals and turn them into more complexity because they, they mix them and your brain does math on them. And you know, Plants have 650 different kinds. Now think about this. Plants can't run away or anything. I mean, if you don't like the smell in this room, you can leave. But a plant can't do that. So plants are equipped to detect everything and respond to whatever happens to them because they can't go anywhere. So they're actually more sensitive and use uh, molecular mechanisms that are very similar to ours. Now the, the air has got to get into the cells. I mean, they don't have a nose to inhale, but, but it can do that. Most of our crops we grow have been selected hard for, uh, for uh, carbon allocation to yield. Right. Has this affected the... Oh, you bet. Absolutely. Um, the ability... Uh, what we've done pretty much consistently is breed both the mechanisms for making chemical defenses out of plants and breeding plants to use their carbon in particular ways that we like at the expense of everything else. Yep. So is there... Is there is this, a, is this an either-or pathway? Well, there's no free lunch. <laughs> okay. And um, people have heard me, uh, I'm just going to get me in trouble, but uh, people have heard me be critical of the Green Revolution on this basis in part because breeding plants for such a heavy investment in productivity has deprived them of the ability to defend themselves. And so what that does is it commits you to pesticide use. It's the only way you're going to manage the situation, which is, of course, in our situation, perfectly reasonable. I'm not bad-mouthing pesticide use. But the reason we don't have any choices, in large part, is that we have created plants that are, you know, sitting ducks. Um, by the way, the original tomato is about this big, hairy, and tastes awful. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, in order to get... 
in, in order to get it this big and taste good, you had to get rid of A, all the nasty chemicals, and B, shift the carbon. Right, exactly, yeah. So, yeah, and there's no free lunch. Question down. Yeah. So, is anybody exploiting this? Like, is anybody taking it yeah. and People are doing that in. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, so can this chemical communication be exploited, for example, with sprays and things? And the answer is yes, although it's getting its greatest use in greenhouses, uh, hothouse tomatoes. Uh, there's a whole set of signals that are specific to disease. Uh, the main one there is called methyl salicylate, and you can buy that. It's a, oh, it's the smell of uh, mint, of spearmint. Uh, and if you flood a greenhouse with methyl salicylate, you'll increase the uh, resistance to several pathogens that way. So yeah, it's being done. This is really hard to control. This airborne stuff is really hard to control outdoors. You know, the wind blows. Uh, and it's remarkable that plants you know, influence each other at all, given that the fact that the wind blows. But it's really hard to commercialize that. Yeah. Hmm? There's one over here. Oh, sorry. Uh, what disrupts the pathways underground? And my question is around tillage and row crops. Yeah. Well, um, first of all, if you break mycorrhizal connections, plants are not going to communicate with each other, okay, to the extent that's interesting. Um, if you, let's see, if you treat with a nematicide, nematicides are not specific to plant nematodes, okay, um, you knock out both beneficial nematodes and harmful nematodes. The effects on the beneficial nematodes, that's obvious. They're controlling some underground pest on your plant, and so you've eliminated the same thing as you do with above ground. But what about the plant parasitic ones? Well, the plant parasitic ones are actually turning on plant defenses that are protecting the plant above ground. Uh, so it, I'm not telling you that there is a, that we know all the specific outcomes, but don't assume that you can do anything, including break connections with tilling, and expect things to operate normally. They don't. I know it's kind of general, but yeah. Control or understand, you know, sometimes where a little bit of information is dangerous. I, <laughs> I have come across this with many products. Oh, there's information traveling in the ground that, you know, they're, they're applying some calcium based product, and somehow that's magic to the crops. You know, yeah. are we just barely scratching the surface of this black box, and how do we protect ourselves against yeah. you know, that sort of? That's actually a much larger question than the application you're describing. Anybody who watched the American election should realize that we are kind of operating in a post-fact era, uh, where it's not just whether a product actually does what it claims, but whether anything is real. I mean, you know, who do you believe? Okay, well, so far, the gold standard on these things is a refereed publication in a good journal. All right, so when I see something like that, the first thing I do is I go look up, if I can find them, I look up the original papers that were published on this to see if A, they were designed well, and B, showed what they said. Uh, and if that's okay, then I might be willing to take a chance. But without that, it's all BS. Yeah. Okay, very good. Sure. Thanks, Jack. My pleasure.